The discussion around network society and networks of power is very intriguing. Ronald DeBear and Raphael Rosinski open up a great discussion in Beyond Denial, introducing next generation information access controls, of which most of this presentation is based. I found their position on social organization and networks of power can be organized into four categories that address human networks and society from early social collectives to organizational governments. The new imperialists arriving in the form of corporations, political and national security, and social awareness and human rights. Deber and Rosinski, coupled with the ideas of theorists studied in this course, provide a base understanding of early network society. Social organization and the technological evolution. We are globally more interconnected than we've ever been at any point in recorded history. Network society focuses on the organizational forms of the network and builds onto foundations of the emerging information society. Prior to the tipping point or threshold of the internet, government satellites were the primary technology for international communication. Now it's fiber optics owned by private companies. The theorists and authors talk about society evolving over the last century and our relationship to the emerging technologies. Latour focuses on actor network theory, where all things are actors, living or inanimate. Ant is rooted in the idea that society's relationship to technology and other non-human actors is based on the interactions of each of these elements for success. Kedushin has a different viewpoint focusing less on the role of technology and more on technology and culture. He writes, the distribution and transmission of culture and social systems across geographic areas, times and generations are arguably the main engines of civilization. We've evolved from hunting and gathering with primitive stone tools to our present high-tech society, from social systems based on small kin, kin groups to national governments and international global systems. Castell focuses on the role of information in social organizations as a result of evolution. He says, because of the convergence of historical evolution and technological change, we've entered a purely cultural pattern of social interaction and organization. This is why information is a key ingredient of our social organization and why flows of messages and images between networks constitute the basic thread of our social culture. The authors, Dibar and Rosinski, write about the resistance to technology and social organization seen in non-Western countries in the 20th century. For example, Stalin opposed the integration of the telephone and society in order to maintain control of Russia. The resistance to progress brought about by communism fell both politically and socially with the rise of the Internet. Dibar and Rosinski write that it unleashed a wide-ranging and globally significant shift in communications, with a growing number of users at edge points of the network. So, what does it all mean? A hundred years ago, if it wasn't written down, it wasn't data. And we didn't call it technology, we called it industrialization. Fifty years ago, information had evolved to become instantaneous. Radio, television, and telephones had become ubiquitous. And we were seeing the barest beginnings of the threshold of data network infrastructure and the network society we recognize today. The new imperialist network operators in the form of corporations such as Google, Apple, Microsoft, that are always safeguarding their interests, sometimes those of their customers, but rarely that of the state. There are networks and social networks, both of which are old forms of social organization. However, social networks of today process and manage information through technologies within surveillance networks. Highly developed democratic societies were thought to be keepers of freedom and trust. However, due to the exposure of surveillance networks, there seems to be dwindling trust in media and public authorities and with fear that users are being manipulated. We see this through examples like the Snowden Affair and network vigilantes like Anonymous. But third-party intermediaries, including private companies, control the online environment according to Deber and Rosinski. Our private information transverses through cables owned and operated by public and private institutions. So what does this mean? Widespread loss of trust in media and institutions might pose a danger to democratic societies and that various forms of participatory network communication might turn out to be the solution to this problem. Politics and national security. The end of the Cold War reduced the communist threat, but it was reassigned with terrorism. The fall of communism, rise of the free market economy and democracy were turning points in social organization and their relationship with technology. Dibar and Rosinski write that the internet has grown in political significance. Cyberspace has become militarized, used by insurgents for acts of terrorism, cyber espionage, pursuing an arms race, 
the landscape of warfare has moved from geographic to digital. The authors focus on ONI, OpenNet Initiative, defined with the aim to uncover evidence of internet content filtering in other countries. They also discuss using second and third generation controls and write about legal conditions that can restrict content and deny access through counter information campaigns, surveillance, and data mining. All of these systems, all of these seem to be efforts to protect freedoms and security from botnets, viruses, and deliberate tampering to disrupt networks that can take down strategically important sources of information at key moments, but it's not all transparent as we see in the next section. Social Awareness and Human Rights The internet became a weapon for the dissemination of child pornography and spotlighting human and political injustices around the world, but what about free speech? Projects like ONI and other forms of cyber policing support the free world and work towards rectifying these types of inequities in less democratic states. We believe that there is a time and place for online policing. In almost all countries, laws have been designed to restrict distribution of child pornography. Guy Barton Rosinski writes, The most important norm is security first, that our concerns are to protect the vulnerable in our population. But they also address the gaping hypocrisy of these types of programs. What does this mean? We most often look to the state to control the values of the organized society. When we're told that we need protection, we take it, but we may be lulled into a false sense of security. Think about how often these protections go against our constitutional rights. Are we all a part of this? When is it good, bad, invasive, justified? Are we all following or even being followed? Look at the case of the Boston bombers. National security was the justification for the investigation, which used business surveillance cameras on the street with images disseminated by mass television, media coverage, and social media platforms online to catch the killers. Massive population indirectly becomes the surveillance network and part of the di digital surveillance state. The world was transfixed with images of the Sarnoff brothers being broadcast across all forms of media in hopes that someone watching would identify them as terrorists. In the back rooms, however, intelligence agencies were watching as well, watching online networks, friends and followers that could not only identify the brothers, but also implicate others. The threat now becomes being linked, knowing, friending, tweeting, or following a suspected terrorist just because of connections through social media networks. The more steps your digital footprint leaves behind, the more you may be watched. In the case of the Boston bombers, intelligence agencies and the rest of the world were invested in finding some clues about the suspects. Facebook pictures and statuses that the suspects provided gave the world their identity. These online connections eventually led them to three individuals suspected of covering up the Sarnoff plot. But what about others who knew the Sarnoffs on social media and had absolutely nothing to do with it? Suddenly it seems like six degrees of separation between them and a federal investigation. Being personally targeted by a powerful in intelligence agency like the NSA would make it very difficult to defend yourself. Much of what the surveillance networks of this type are doing is mass surveillance on everybody and hoping somebody fits the profile. In a digital age, we are increasingly defined as much by our online networks as our offline actions. What's alarming in all this is how the rest of the internet is essentially volunteering its time and expertise to help out. As responsible, protective citizens taking pride in our civic duty to contribute to a safe society, we're all in this. But what happens if, in a few years, the government has built a surveillance state based on the civic contribution, which is filled with more cameras, volunteer watchers, and starts to suspect anyone of wrongdoing because of something that they've retweeted or a person they've friended? What if you look a certain way or speak a certain language and end up being, being social media profiled? What if you were picked up by the feds? There's something distinctly Orwellian about an all-knowing state being able to zero in on our past social network activity. A lot of false positives could be made very quickly, and with everything happening in real time, it could be a nightmare to sort out. In a digital surveillance state, cameras are everywhere. Surveillance networks can get real scary real fast, bursting the bubble and transforming our social networks into antisocial surveillance networks. 